Good afternoon. Welcome to North Thurston Public Schools grading practices for secondary schools for parents and guardians, a learning at lunchtime webinar. We appreciate everyone who is participating today. My name is Nikki Grubbs. I'm an assistant superintendent over school leadership at North Thurston. And I'd like to introduce to you a few of my colleagues who are helping to conduct this presentation today. The first is Ms. Joyce Makowitz. She's our director of math and science. Thank you for being here. Also, Josh Parker, he's an instructional specialist over social studies. And Ms. Kim Tennant is an instructional specialist for English language arts. And then we also have executive director of student achievement, Sarah Rich. Thank you all for being here. Today, we want to share with you a few of what we call learning targets in the classroom. And it's like an agenda. It's what we hope you learn about today by the end of the session. And the first, we're going to provide you with a bit of history of the grading practices work in North Thurston Public Schools. We're going to share the purpose of shifting our grading practices. And we're also going to share four grading practice principles that we're committed to. We're going to dispel myths that we've heard and share some understanding around the importance of rubrics. So here's the learning targets that you went through and there's Kim's first slide. So just let me know when to advance. Okay, I'm Kimberly Tennant, and I, as um, uh, Nikki introduced me, I'm the secondary ELA instructional specialist. So I'm going to be talking to you as an instructional specialist, but also as a parent um, of two children who have gone through North Thurston Public Schools as middle school and high schoolers. Um, middle school can feel a lot, can feel overwhelming. And then once you get middle school, you're catapulted right into high school. And so it can be a lot. Just when the kids have figured out elementary, everything is different. So go ahead, Josh, you can just click on the, on the bullets. Students go from having one class to having six classes. They have six different teachers, six different contents, six different grading practices, and six different messages about what learning looks like. And on top of that, they only have four to five minutes to get to class every day. So it can feel like a fire hose, right? Every day. And then they have lunch, which in itself is can be a scary thing for kids. Um, so they're being inundated with, a, oh, sorry, a lot of information. Um, the math teacher, for example, a student in middle and high school can have a math teacher who determines their final grade by pop quizzes and daily assignments. And then another teacher counts participation and attendance. Another might allow retakes with no penalty while only while another um, only can receive 80% if they do a retake. So it can be very, very conf confusing for kids. Go ahead, next slide, Josh. And it's also really overwhelming for parents. And in my experience as a parent, um, I want when I send my kids to school, I don't want to send them through this gate where it's like this land of we hope they return from. I want to know that I am welcome and that there is there are systems in place that I'm just not sending my kid over a boundary um, that I'm not allowed to cross over into. I also want to have tools to understand what my students are learning and why they're learning it and what does that look like. Um, and sometimes I think parents at the secondary level feel like they don't have the same skill level in the subjects. Like, I don't know anything about calculus. How can I help my child? Or they're in middle school and high school. They should know how to do school by now. We know that's not true, right? In fact, it seems like they, they haven't learned anything sometimes when they get into middle and high school because it is so much different. And then also too, you just figured out how to parent your, ele your elementary child and now they are suddenly a teenager. Um, and often, too, you get the standard fine or nothing when you ask how their day was. Um, and then also they get A's, but we might not really know why. And then some po folks might be thinking, well, as long as they get an A, I'm OK with it. But what if they don't get an A? And what if they do? What does that grade actually tell you? This is what happens. Well, I will speak for myself, but this can happen in your in your house when they're, we are ch children become adolescents and, you know, they're wanting more autonomy, right? More independence. 
Um, and standards referenced grading and four point grading really promotes that interdependence um, among learning targets and student involvement. Um, oftentimes our conversations with our children can devolve into a shouting match or not feeling heard and your child will walk away with the message that either they're dumb or school is dumb. And so we wanna um, try to avoid that by being as transparent um, as we can in our grading practices. Um, and it also alleviates the feeling that school's being done to them. They can be actual participants in this because the targets are clear and their success criteria and what it looks like is clear to students and what they need to work on as well. Um, the other thing too, like, so these, I just gave this an ex example. There's an A and there's an F and you have an A plus excellent at the top of the paper. That's great, it feels good to get an A. And then you see the big F with all the markings. These are a tale of two grades, both go in the grade book, but neither one of them really give you very much feedback that students can use mo moving forward. Um, the F paper looks more like a penalty, right, for students rather than an opportunity for growth. A four point grading system does not make it easier to pass or harder to earn an A. What it does do is it creates that transparency. You can move to the next um, slide, Josh, that transparency. Um, and it turns into something that grades are not just about what students earn, they're about what students learn. And tr the transparency and clarity in a four point grading system asks students, what am I learning? Why am I learning it? How will I know I have learned it? And how is my learning connected to prior learning? And how will it prepare me for future learning? Oftentimes in traditional education, once you're done with a unit, you're done. And then you move on to the next thing and it feels really confusing and disjointed for students. Also too, for teachers on the right-hand side, teachers really have to think about what are my goals for students and why are they important? Not just, I need to teach the next chapter, but what are my overall goals? How is it connected to standards? What will students have to practice and what work will I ask of them? How will I evaluate their work? And what information does the grade and feed, grades and feedback give my students about what they've learned? Um, oftentimes students just kind of, well, as an English teacher, it used to frustrate me when I'd spend all weekend grading papers and I gave them the grade and they just looked at it and threw it in the garbage. And so a four point grading system is very clear to students and it gives them the opportunity to reflect and to assess what, what else they need. And it gives teachers really good feedback so they can either reteach or move on. So let's see, I think that we probably um, could dive into some of these concepts a little bit more. Um, I wonder, um, Kim, Kim or Nikki, if you could expand on why does the grading tell us something different from the feedback that students were getting with a 100 point scale? What's different about that? You're, you're muted, Nikki. By using a four point scale, it makes it really clear with accompanying rubrics or checklists or assignment descriptors um, exactly what students are supposed to be doing or showing that they know. And they can compare that to the assignment guide or the rubric to see how far they are away from a learning target. So it makes it really, really clear why students are graded the way they are in this system that we're looking at. Whereas in a zero to 100 point scale system, it's really challenging, if not impossible, for a teacher to describe the difference between a 77 and a 78. So that's that's one idea. Hope Great. that helps. Thank you. Um, Can I add to that? Oh, yeah, Can please go ahead, Kim. Yep. I mean, and I think, you know, when we think about four point grading too, it really, you know, it really focuses in on the standards and what kids know and can do. Um, and 
oftentimes in the, in the traditional grading system, a lot of the things that are graded are, are based on things like work ethic and you know, compliance and whether or not a student knows how to jump through the hoops. And if you don't know that system very well, it can be very unclear. Whereas the four point grading system with, with strong rubrics and checklists, kids can see what it is that it, they need to do to earn that grade and not just earn it, but learn. So um, could you speak a little bit to um, whether or not this system will penalize kids that are getting good grades? Is it really about just benefiting those students who struggle? It's actually beneficial to all kids because overall it provides more clarity to kids on exactly what they need to do or show that they know as it relates to the learning targets at each grade level. So I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more down in the slide deck as we move along through this presentation. So clarifying, and, clarifying question. So high school students will either get a one, two, three, or four on all of their assignments in all subjects. Um, so is there no variance in between like the 100 point scale has for students who are above average, but maybe not a straight A? So this next year coming forward, we're going to, there, there will be a blend of um, different styles of grading as teachers learn and further develop their four point scales. And then the following year, we will go um, to a four point scale exclusively. And what was that second part of the question, Miss Sarah? Uh, the question is also like, what is their variance? So I, I'm interpreting the question. So there's 100 point scale has a lot of possible scores. Is it just a, okay. an integer? Is it just a one, two, three, or four? Or could you get a 3.5 or a 3.2? We will have the ability to allow for teachers to have increments of 0.5s in the grading system. But if you get too many of them, you'll end up having the same issues that we have with the 100 point scale, where it's not clearly defined what each increment actually means. So um, I, I the research shows that around you want seven or fewer integers in your system. I can give an example of that when I when I show my rubric later uh, that the okay. social studies teachers have been working on about like it is just the integers that we're scoring with, but then sometimes you end up with a um, a three here and a four there, so you might give a three point five as the overall or things like that. So I'll show that later. Great, Thank we have you. another attendee who wants to see an example, and I know that's coming up next, so I won't I won't have you answer that question. Um, the remaining question is, does this make it a standards-based grading system? And then what support are teachers going to get to do lesson planning for this new system? So we consider this a standards referenced and a standards-based grading system. That would be where you put every, you publish every single standard on the report card. And so your report card ends up being pages and pages long because you would give a score for each standard and each strand under that standard. But in this case, our teachers are still planning with standards. And so we are relating all the work and the activities back to what they're expected to know and be able to do based on their content area standards as well as being prepared for state tests. And that's all the questions for now. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and advance the slide. I think it's back to me again. I wanna share with you just a little bit about the history of the work. It really started around 2018. Um, we identified in our district that grading and reporting practices were an area that we needed to improve, especially in consistency and communication. 
Then in 2018, we developed a 25 person task force that consisted of six through 12th grade representative teachers. And those teachers worked together, collaborated, studied research and read books. Uh, then in 2019, the task force recommended four grading principles that I'm going to show you. In the fall of 2021, we convened a community conversation so that we could get input from a variety of different people in the community, including parents. Then our school board affirmed that the four grading principles that were developed would need to be strengthened and consistent throughout the district. One of the reasons was to develop consistency as school board members and staff were hearing that teachers were grading differently from building to building or from grade level to grade level and classroom to classroom. So we wanted kids to have common experiences and for our grades to be transparent to all parents and kids. We also wanted to be really clear in our communication about what teachers expected students to know and be able to do. And finally, we wanted to link back this work to our strategic plan and our district's goals. So we wanted students to be able to make choices about how they learn and to be able to provide input to teachers, but also to be able to show what they know in a variety of different ways. Uh, the traditional paper pencil tests don't work as well for every student. And so kids needed opportunities to be able to show teachers what they know with different ways to do that, whether it be a presentation, a project, um, an assignment they could provide, or just explaining it to the teacher. Okay, Josh. The first principle was that grades must clearly communicate the student success towards their learning standards. So we wanna make sure that all assignments and assessments are aligned to learning standards. Sometimes there's drift in teacher practice and you might have experienced as a parent to hear about assignments that just sound like, hmm, maybe they're just filling time and they're not necessarily teaching kids what they need to know. We also wanted teachers to be really clear and to publicize what they want kids to know at the beginning of the class period. And we call those learning targets. So we want teachers to be explicit about sharing what it is kids need to know. And the research shows that that um, helps to raise student learning and achievement. We were looking at a four point summative grading scale to be implemented across all secondary schools. And again, like I shared earlier, we're gonna be in a transition phase where sometimes teachers are going to be using a hundred point scale to grade, but ultimately our new grade book system will produce a one, two, three, or four in the final grade of an assignment. So the computer translates the assignment that's being done on a zero to 100 point scale to a four point scale. Um, and that's just for one transition year and the following school year, all will be on a four point scale. And then finally, we wanted to make sure that extra credit was optional but we wanted to ensure that it wasn't something like bring canned food to the canned food drive to get extra credit and contributing to the grade because grades should be about what kids know, understand, and can do, not something completely different. Like I went to an event on a Saturday. Principles two has to do with understanding by design. And that has to do with multiple opportunities for kids to show what they know. So we want a grade to represent a body of work that students have done and completed and mastered in their classes. So that can look like class activities, essays, labs, portfolios, projects, 
And for some classes, those are skills-based like PE and music. So those could be performances. We expect that our teachers are keeping their grades current and that they have supporting data behind all grades assigned. Um, parents need to be able to have an opportunity to see what grades represent and what that body of work looks like. We also expect that our teachers keep those up to date and current in the electronic grading system that parents will have access to. We also, and you may have seen this, that most teachers are already practicing this, but they accept late work. It may not be for every type of assignment, but often teachers will accept late work up to a point in the grading period. And that just means the work is important enough that even if you didn't do it by the, the first deadline, that we still value that work and want kids to complete the work so that they can further their learning. Okay, Josh. Principle three, this is students need time and practice to learn from mistakes. Educational research shows that the best way to learn is to make a mistake and to correct it. And something happens in our brains when that happens. And it's very powerful. So we want to encourage kids that it's okay to try things and to make mistakes. We also want to give them a variety of different types of opportunities to demonstrate that they understand the standards and that they can meet them. Assignments, activities, performances, and assessments. So tests, quizzes, or other activities that show what kids know. We also want teachers to use those assessments the ways that they assess what kids understand to shape their future instruction. So it, they might see that kids aren't, they missed something, they didn't get it. So that informs the teacher that he or she needs to reteach or teach it and show it in a different way. And finally, principle four, Supporting learning through regular communication with families, we want to make sure that families are getting regular updates. We want progress reports four times a year, and those can be seen with report cards, progress reports, or having conferences. We also want that online grade book that teachers use to be updated at least every two weeks and always available for parents and kids to dig into. Thank you. We want you to know that this work is aligned to our strategic plan in North Thurston School District. Two goals that specifically align are goal number four, which is around continuous growth for all kids in all subjects. We're focusing on how they're growing in their learning and performance and not necessarily a final score. All kids are at different places, so we'd like to see growth for every kid. And in goal five, we want to prepare kids for post-secondary success. That might mean college, a university, but it could also mean a trade school or the workforce. So the big question is, why are we focusing on grading practices? The most important significant reason is around clarity for kids. For kids who tend to be high achievers, this is really important because now they're going to be seeing these assignment guides and rubrics and checklists that make it really, really clear what they need to do and show to earn their grades. Um, there's this will minimize the guessing that probably many of you have experienced. I know I did, especially in college, where you would study the notes that the professor would give or the teacher would give and study the content, go in to take the test, and it's on something completely different that was never presented in class. So 
that's kind of the big example. We want to make sure that kids are being on, assessed on something that's related back to that learning target and those learning standards. It also allows for more equity for historically disadvantaged students. Um, and it's reflecting a grade that is not representative of a student's behavior or whether he has a pencil when he enters the classroom, um, whether he's fooling around, um, maybe not having the perfect behavior of a quiet, attentive student, but we don't want to mix grades that are based on learning targets with behaviors in school. Um, those are two different things and we want to keep them separated. We really want this to be about learning. And the focus is going to shift to learning instead of uh, the commodity of points and getting points that's not tied to learning at all for kids. So we really want kids to be focused on more clarity around learning. And that strengthens the trust between the teacher and the student. Now there's no guessing game for kids on what they need to do to get the A. We also wanna to move to a system that's more accurate and mathematically sound easy to understand and accurately describes what the student's performance reflects in academics. So the zero to four scale is very significant. Um, we do approve of awaiting more recent performance, especially when it's a content area that builds upon itself. Um, the more recent work demonstrates uh, cumulative knowledge in that content area. And then we don't want kids to get a single group grade when they work in a group. We want each student to get the grade that reflects their own participation. Okay, Josh. So this is a really important piece that a lot of people have questions about. Why are we moving to a zero to four point scale rather than the traditional zero to 100 point scale that we all went to school with? So I'm just gonna show you the difference between the 100 point scale on this chart and the zero to four point scale. There's a hundred different gradations to know the difference between each increment in the traditional scale. And that's really for difficult for teachers and for kids especially to discern the difference between a 74 and a 75, whereas there's only five gradations in a zero to four scale. I want to show you this part. This is the biggest piece. Zero to 59 in that 100 point scale represents failing in that grade, whereas only the zero represents failing in the zero to 100 the zero to four point scale. 60% of that 100 point scale represents failing scores, whereas only 20% in the zero to four point scale. The scores of 80 to 100 represent proficiency in meeting standards. And a three or a four in the zero to four point scale represents proficiency. This is the representation 40% of how much of a 100 point scale is dedicated to passing scores, but 80% of the zero to four point scale represents passing scores. And finally, in meeting standards, only 20% of that 100 point scale represents meeting standards, whereas 40% is represented in the zero to four point scale. So I'm gonna show you why it's more fair in this next slide. This is the zero to 100 point scale. And this chart shows right here, 60% of it is dedicated to the F. So if a student doesn't do a couple of assignments, maybe two to three assignments in a grading term, it's next to impossible to recover because of the 
significant damage as zero does. It pulls you down so far that it's hard to recover and it makes it unmotivating to even try to make up all those assignments that are missing. So the A, the B, the C, and the D all have equal weights here, but the F just really takes over the zero to 100 point grading scale. And so mathematically, it makes more sense. And the research shows that it makes more sense to move to a zero to four point scale. Okay, go ahead and move to the next slide. Many, many of you are interested in this. This is what the grading scale looks like. We're gonna have a transition year where some assignments may still be graded on a 100 point scale, but our system is going to change that in the electronic gradebook system to the four point scale. And this is how it converts to the letter grade. It's important for you to know that students don't have to have all fours to get an A. So a 3.65 to a four point is an A in this situation. So it's okay for kids to get threes and some fours and still be able to earn an A. Okay, go ahead and transition. I want to address a couple of myths that we've been hearing. The first myth is kids will not be able to get into college because of our shift in grading practices. In reality, students are still getting letter grades. And in fact, when the transcripts go to the colleges, they're still going to see the letter grades the way they have in the past. So really, they wouldn't even know that we're on a four point scale unless they dug deeply into a student's grade book. I've also had conversations with colleges and universities in our local area, and I'll show you a list of those soon. Um, I've been told by the colleges that the four point scale actually better aligns, um, mostly due to the use of rubrics in college. And so all of them were super enthusiastic, positive, and go ahead and move to the next slide. And I'll show you those are South Puget Sound Community College, St. Martin's, UW Tacoma, Central Washington, and Evergreen College. I know some of you are interested in UW in Seattle, and I've reached out to them several times, but we haven't had a response yet. Okay. Another myth I want to address is there's this idea that by having a four point scale, kids get free B's, passing grades, even if they do nothing. And that's absolutely not true. Students still need to perform and show proficiency towards standards to earn their scores. We're changing to a four point scale to add clarity so that kids are really, really clear about what they need to know and be able to do. It also helps teachers to be really clear and to really be thoughtful about the activities they're having kids do. Are they just time fillers or are they helping kids to learn the standards? And then also we're moving away from points as a commodity to learning towards the standards. And it also helps us to move away from the damage of a zero and be able to recover. Okay. After this section, do you have questions? We have one question in the chat so far. Okay. Um, I'm, and I'll just read it. I think you've already answered some of it, but I'll just okay. read it. Uh, I'm wondering how all of this will impact GPAs for college entrance to rigorous colleges. Have you looked at other schools that have done this? What are their outcomes? And uh, removing the variance and having only one to four grading with 0.5 variance only will impact GPAs. Okay, I'll have to ask you for that second part. Okay. And just a, a bit about the 
0.5s. So how will it impact GPAs for college entrance to rigorous colleges? Do we know of other school districts that have done this and what their outcomes are? And then concern about only one to four grading with 0.5 variance. Okay. I guess I would need to know what the concern is. There shouldn't be any type of negative impact to colleges. In fact, kids are still gonna have a traditional GPA the way that they normally do. So unless a college um, asked for a kid's electronic grade book and access to it to see what all their scores on their assignments were. And I've never heard of a college and institution doing that. They look at the overall transcripts. They look at students' participation in community activities. Um, and they look at the, the grades throughout the years to see if they're consistent. But there shouldn't be any negative impact on students' abilities to get into college. And keep in mind that teachers still have the authority over how they grade students. So teachers determine what those assignments are. And they determine how to develop the rubrics and the assignment criteria. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Yeah, yes. I can add a thought. Um, it seems like this is this is a great question. It's one of the more common ones that I field. Because we're talking about a four-point grading scale, it's sometimes easy to sort of equate that with the GPA, which is a four-point scale, and and you know merge the two. They're very different in terms of what we're doing. So a student will compile a body of evidence and they're graded on the four-point scale with increments of 0.5. So basically they end up with some form of an average of all of that body of evidence and they'll end up with a score that maybe it's a 3.7. What that equates to on their transcript is an A. Then once the GPA calculation happens, it has nothing to do with the 3.7 they earned. They have a solid A and that A goes into the GPA calculation as a four. And so it shouldn't adjust GPAs in any way other than more students are going to know exactly what's expected to get an A or a B, et cetera. And so it's likely that they will achieve higher grades overall. We're hoping the GPAs actually look stronger. I think it's a concern generally um, if you're a parent of a strong student that it's going to be harder to achieve. And the reality is I think it'll be more clear to them on what exactly what they have to be doing to perform at the level that they're already achieving at. Um, and there's some comfort in that predictability and it should not negatively impact the overall GPA. So I hope that helps with that. So I think a clarifying question that came in from I think the same person who asked that question, Joyce, you may have just addressed it. So the body of work at the end of the semester may result in a 3.7. We're not saying that there's only a 0.5 variance in those final grades. We're saying that each right. assignment or each assessment would, would have the 0.5 variance. So in the end, you could have a 3.9 grade. You could have a 3.8. Um, so for the uh, for the attendee who asked that question, if we're still not answering it. Please put something else in the in the chat to make sure we've answered that question. Can I just add something too? As a parent who just um, had her daughter graduate from college a couple of years ago, um, I also I think that the standards referenced grading and the creation of rubrics and that clarity for students and families. Um, there was a study that was done that 30% of freshmen drop out either during or after their freshman year in college. And that what that ties to is that sometimes maybe there's a discrepancy between the grades that they received in high school and what they were actually prepared to do in college. And so I feel like as a parent, I want to make sure that my student not only gets into college, but I want to make sure they stay there and that they know that they are adequately prepared um, for the rigor of college as well. Great. And then Thank just a, a comment about um, some local districts. Um, a couple that I know of are Bethel and Vashon Island. And I think our crew here knows of some other districts. Uh, Stanwood was one. Um, there's several that are launching into the full standards-based um, standards 
grading. And just keep in mind that's a little bit different because teachers are asked to give a score to each standard in their content area, which is quite a few. That's a lot of grading to do. And so you'll see mixed results around that style of grading practice because they're having to um, input more scores than they might typically do. And there might be some other concerns about it. So it provides a teacher workload um, whereas with standards reference, we're still grading the same uh, volume of work and volume of assignments that we would typically in a year. But those assignments are designed based on the standards in that content area. Does anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll add just some context because I've fielded some questions about what do we mean when we say standards referenced? You know, isn't that just terminology? And I guess I want to reassure people that what we're talking about is making sure that the things that we are teaching, the things that we are assessing, the things that we are assigning work towards collecting evidence of student learning is all connected to the standards. That has to be the, the focus, and that's the filter. So when we say referenced, we mean we're planning knowing what the standards are, and we're planning uh, a sequence of learning events to help students achieve that standard. And then when you turn it around and communicate out to students what the expectation will be around the grading, it's going to be referenced to those same things that we are referencing when we plan. So it should be more transparent. Students should know exactly what it is I'm learning, that it is in fact connected to standards. It's part of what I'm expected to be learning. And what is it going to look like when I have learned it, what does proficiency look like? And in a detailed enough format that I actually know what it is I'm trying to achieve. So the standards referenced is something we're going to take really strongly to heart. Um, and I just wanted to weigh in on that question that no one's asked, but I think a lot of people think of. Thank you, Joyce. We don't have any more questions right now. OK, we're going to move to Josh. I think some more questions will be answered as Josh presents his piece of information here. Well, hi there, folks. Um, I'm Josh Parker. I'm a social studies specialist. I work uh, with secondary social studies teachers and, and, and other teachers, but primarily secondary social studies teachers. And when we uh, knew that the uh, district was going to move toward a four-point scale, there's already some social studies teachers who have been using Four point scale for quite some time. Uh, and so they were able to be teacher leaders. I was able to bring a, a team together and knowing that we wanted our um we wanted our our, our grading to be uh, referenced to really clear rubrics. And we have 70 social studies teachers in the district. So we didn't want all of those teachers to create rubrics on their own. So we we got together and we've done a, a number of uh sessions to work on creating some sort of draft generic rubrics that then teachers can take and tweak for their particular learning targets and assignments based off social studies standards. So uh, I'll just kind of show you, this is a list of some of the first ones that we did. Um, we have a, full, a shared folder. This uh, four point scale that's on the left side of the screen here um, is kind of the generic uh, district four point scale that's giving guidance to the teachers as we work to, to prepare for this transition. Uh, four is uh, advanced learning with regard to the uh, learning target. And uh, three is proficient. You're meeting that learning target. Two, developing. Uh, you may be able to meet that learning target with support, but you're not doing it independently yet. Uh, one, you're beginning. You're, you're, you're making progress. You're showing that you are learning, but you're really not um, even able to do the learning target with support yet. And uh, zero really doesn't mean that people don't know anything. It just means we don't have evidence. Um, as teachers yet uh, that they know anything toward that uh, standards aligned learning target. So we have this rubrics folder. I'm just going to show you a couple of examples. Um, and we continue to develop some. In fact, yesterday we added uh, four more generic rubrics to our folder. Uh, but here, here's an example. A lot of teachers are really comfortable with using a um, uh, a rubric for a, like an essay uh, that you have specific to the essay prompt. Uh, but they were wondering, like, how do we use this four point scale just with our like day to day work? We do a lot of note taking. We might watch a video and take some notes. We might um, 
have a short lecture and take some notes. We might do do a reading and take some notes. So teachers wonder, like, how do I score? You know, I've just checked it off, but how do I score notes? Um, and so a lot of teachers use something called Cornell notes or focus notes. And so we developed this to be used with those uh, styles of note taking. Proficient, obviously, is meeting the target. So whatever the, the target the teachers laid out, um, that's what we're looking for here. So they they obviously are going to have some details and facts and information. Um, and those notes are uh, addressing those details and facts. Um, we encourage students to sort of interact with their notes by adding question head questions or headings to different chunks of notes. And so that's what the second box down under proficient looks like um, to help them synthesize the information. And we encourage students to go back through their notes after uh, taking a chunk of notes and summarize them so that they're able to um, sort of uh, have the short, uh, the sort of gist of what the notes are about. So we're looking for summaries in our notes. So those are the kind of the three categories for typical note taking. And then, of course, we always want to be clear with students. How do you how do you earn a four? What does it mean to um, go beyond? And so uh, we've had a lot of discussion in social studies about what that means. And in social studies, uh, generally speaking, we've determined that earning a four uh, means that you're you're making connections beyond the current learning to either prior learning that we've done in class or to learning in other courses or to current events or even a discussion you've had with your parents at the dinner table. Um, that's that's the the ways that we want students to not just like take in the information they're learning in class, but actually like digest it, make connections to it and, and go beyond. So they become um, sort of active consumers of information and responsible citizens. Uh, and so with the notes, those are some of the opportunities to earn a four. There's also, um, we encourage students to actually interact with their notes and do something with them and review them. And so if there's evidence of that, that's another way to earn a four. And of course, two is um, not quite proficient. One is a beginning and, and of course, no evidence zero. So that's that's one example. I'll just show you one other um, in social studies, we're often analyzing primary sources, whether that's a newspaper clipping or a, um, or a political cartoon or a news report or a presidential speech or whatever it may be. We do a lot of analysis of primary sources. So uh, teachers wanted uh, a typical way that they would assess uh, student learning with regard to that, you'll see a lot of similarities to this rubric from the last one I showed you. Proficient lays out the sort of things we expect students to do with primary sources. We want them to source them. We want them to know, like, where did this come from? Uh, who's the author? When did it happen? Et cetera. We want students to know the context of it. Like, why, you know, okay, this is a presidential speech, but, you know, it was in the midst of the Civil War or it was um, in the midst of the Great Depression or whatever. Like, uh, the, the context helps them interpret. We want them to be really lay out like what are the facts in this source and then also do some interpretation of those facts. And we want them to evaluate the reliability of sources. We don't want them to just take sources on face value. So those are kind of the four things that we generally are asking students to do. Those are the things we would look for for proficiency. We might not use all parts of this rubric for every primary source we look at. We might just focus on sourcing with us, with students or whatever. But this gives teachers a place to to start for their for their work with te with students. Um, and of course, uh, there are clear ways that they can earn a four and get into the advanced category. Here, in this case, they might make a claim about the source. They might um, make connections to other relevant information. Uh, compare this source to other um, other sources make personal thoughts and wonders, but of course they have to be proficient first before they go beyond and earn, earn the four. So anyway, wanted to share a couple of the examples social studies is working on and working with and the support we're giving teachers to, to, uh, find clarity in this shift to four point. And now I'm passing to Joyce. Yeah, so this actually may answer the additional question I see in the chat in the Q&A, um, and that is how does uh, it work in a math classroom? So the example here is some work that we're currently doing on preparing for assessments in math. And the on the right hand side is just a little snip of the top portion of one of our current assessments, actually, and then obviously some items are sort of blocked out a little bit. Um, so students um, basically are 
on, on any math assessment are being assessed on two or three different standards that they have been working on within a, a module of uh, math instruction. And they're often just scattered throughout the assessment. Our curricular assessments pretty much look at if 20 assignments were there, you'll see 20 different things represented on the test. And so here's what we're doing. First of all, we're looking through those curricular assessments and really focusing in on the standards aligned items, the most important critical learning that shows proficiency on that particular standard. So we're simplifying them and improving them. That's the first step. Then we're taking the items and organizing them by the two or three standards. So they're in groups. And it's very, it's going to be very clear to students that this next group, like these questions one through five, are about this particular standard. So they know exactly what they're being assessed on in each group within the assessment. And then within that group, there's a four-point rubric to assign a score for that group of assessed items. So if we are assessing a student's ability on one specific standard, there may be three, four, or five items in there, and we're looking at the whole body of evidence to make a determination of whether or not they are proficient on that standard, or if they are showing advanced understanding, or if they're in one of the other categories with no evidence, emerging evidence um, developing. So um, we think that this is actually going to be really assisting students in doing better. For example, it's not uncommon for a student to get all the answers correct, but they didn't show any work. Or they got them right, but they didn't label their answers. So they get dinged a point and that lowers their grade. What we are working on, these are teachers working on this. So they're having these great conversations and we're working towards a grading system in math where we're looking at the body of evidence to determine whether or not a student has actually learned um, the target. And so a student could make an error. If it's real obvious that they've made a simple calculation error, but they clearly understand the procedure required, then that's going to actually probably get a higher score than they're currently getting. They'll actually get credit for proving that they understand that. It also help in the retake portion of things where a student is going to very clearly see what pieces they need to be doing to go back and retake and get that higher score. Um, we have some places where we've been working closely with teachers doing this already in math. And what we see and hear of evidence of student achievement and success in the class in terms of grading is, is amazing. We're super inspired by what we're seeing in classrooms where this is being done. It's not done a lot in math classrooms. Um, so we're super excited about what we're, what we're attempting to do here. But this is just one example of the things that we're working on. Thank you, Joyce. And I, I just shared this slide again because, um, you know, at the beginning of the school year, teachers, there's a lot that we have to teach, right? There's a lot to learn, a lot to be covered. And I really feel like this, um, the four point grading and standards reference um, grading will help us kind of sift through all the stuff that might not be essential and find those kind of those golden nuggets um, that, you know, students will be very clear about what that looks like. Um, and so I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about how this is going to improve um, instruction. And when we send our kids to school, right, we wanna make sure that we are sending them to teachers who are competent and skilled and um, you know, are good for our kids. And so I wanted to show some of the work that language arts is doing. You can go ahead and um, around that right-hand side with the blue. So um, one of the things that I've sat down with teachers as we're kind of getting used to this, you know, the, the, this new grading approach um, is for teachers to really reflect on what is it that, what are my main goals for students this year? Um, just what's really important to me as a language arts teacher, um, as a ninth grade language arts teacher. And um, so for example, one of the goals that came up was that and it's important that students know, show how they are reading to understand in various formats and genres, and that they can identify key ideas and themes in a text and analyze how and why individuals and events and ideas developed and interact over a course of the text. So that's my goal, right, as a, my, as a teacher. Why that goal? Well, for me as an English teacher, I know that students can't go deeper into the implicit meaning of a text if they don't have the surface meaning of a text. So I know that I'm gonna have to do some things to have building blocks before that. Okay, what? how is that tied to standards? And that's just for me as a teacher, like, okay, 
you know, it's what standards one, two, and three. And so when I'm making it clear to my students, I can say, I am learning how to read and understand um, in literary text, or I am learning how to identify key ideas and themes. And so what are the stepping stones to get there? Um, so I, as a teacher, then I have to think about, you know, what are they gonna have to practice to master this? And they have to cite, learn how to cite evidence, determine two or more central ideas and provide a summary of the text. This is for an eighth grader. Um, and so then using this as a teacher, I say, okay, so what are the things that I'm gonna have to ask, that I'm gonna have them do? And the things that, so I made a list of things that would, of activities that I might do in my classroom um, and that teachers actually do in their classroom. And I, then I have to think to myself, what am I going to assess? And what am I going to give students feedback on? Because I'm going to have my students do a lot of things, but I don't necessarily grade all of them. And so keeping clear about, you know, what type of feedback I'm giving students and then what am I going to grade? So we do reading paragraphs and see, they're, they're called different things, but CEI, claim evidence interpretation. I know I'm going to have them doing those a lot. So therefore, I'm going to sit with my colleagues and we're going to write a rubric that's very transparent to students about what a four looks like. Um, and then same with one pagers and summary writing. Some of the other things like text annotations, I'm not gonna grade because uh, students are gonna be using those to engage with the text and they might use it to engage with classmates, but I'm not necessarily going to grade those. So we just wanted to be really clear. So the next slide is just an example of something I worked with with an English teacher. So the standards referenced grading gives specific feedback about the level um, the students performed on and, and how it's connected to standards. So um, this is a teacher at Nisqually Middle School. We sat down and pulled out standard 10 um, for reading. And it's that they can read and comprehend including st um, stories, dramas, and poems in their grade six through eight complexity band. The kids don't necessarily have to see that, but as a teacher, I know that I want my kids to read, have wide reading. And so I'm gonna have them keep a reading log and I'm gonna, I'm gonna devote part of my time every day to kids to, for reading, whether it's together or in their independent books. Um, but they're gonna keep a log of their pages to see um, you know, how their fluency has increased. Um, they can answer text-based questions about their books and they can self-assess. And that's really what we want students to do, right? Is become um, more autonomous and independent in their learning. And so those are the things that were important to her and she's made it very clear to students. And when she gives them feedback, she can say, well, you logged your pages, but you didn't really show that you could answer text-based questions. So we're gonna work on that. So um, that's just some of the work that we've started in language arts as well. So we have a question, um, clarification. How does this help high school students prepare for college if colleges do not allow test retakes? and give partial credit when students answer part of a math question correct, but the final answer is wrong. It helps them to learn the content of the standards and to ensure that the grades that they are getting are around learning and not just coming to school prepared and on time. Those are important as well but we wanna make sure that grades are accurate and based on their learning. And the more that they learn in our K-12 system, the better prepared they're going to be for college. That's the only other question in the chat so far. Okay, thank you so much everyone for your time. I wanna thank Joyce, Josh, Kim Tennant and Sarah Rich, thank you so much for your assistance. And thank you to all the families out there who are listening and tending to your kids and ensuring they have a great education. We appreciate your support and your partnership.